The Bible reading is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Boys and girls, members of our congregation, people listening, I have a question to ask you very simply. I wonder how many different forms of communication you can think of. I wonder if you were given 15 minutes, I am sure that list of methods of communication would be fairly long. Whenever I thought of that, I was thinking, of course, of all the electronical ways that we communicate with one another. Phone call, um, or maybe an email, a text message, or dare I say the word Zoom, Um, but we have used various different forms of communication this past year, and people communicate in all different forms. I thought of another one that was on the news not so long ago, a message in a bottle where you put something into a bottle, you cast it off, and perhaps thousands of miles later, or another country altogether, continent altogether, someone might pick it up and read the message that is in that bottle, a message in a bottle. I wonder though, is there many people who still write letters? Do any still people still write letters today? Some of us still write letters, good, good. Well, whenever we were back on our Friday night youth club at Merge, we had a series called Dear 16-Year-Old Self. And each week, one of the leaders would share a letter that they wrote as if they were writing it to themselves when they were 16 years old. Each letter contained lessons learnt, things that had shaped who they were, a testimony of how God was with them in various stages, but also a testimony of how God was walking with them, even though they probably didn't know it at the time. And as they look back to their 16-year-old self, to where they are today, they had known that God had walked with them. Well, in our reading this morning, Paul is writing or has written a letter, and he has written the letter that Rachel read to us, part of it, from prison. Chapter 1, verse 2, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. He is writing to a group of people that he has never met before, never physically met. The church that started there and the spread of the gospel was started by a man named Epaphras. And he visits Paul in prison, giving them an update of how things are going. And he tells Paul, yes, the Christians are standing strong, but however, there are cultural pressures that are tempting people away from Jesus. And as we think of 2021, not much has changed. There are many cultural pressures That are on us as believers today. A thing that he was talking about was false teachers promoting a gospel that was anything but of that of Jesus. So Paul writes a letter inspired by God to encourage the believers at Colossae to raise the issues that Epaphras has raised, challenging them to a greater devotion in their faith. Like a parent writing a letter writing a letter to their child. Paul pours out his heart with Christ-centered teaching, but also firm warnings of what they believe and why they believe it. This little letter packs a punch 
full of great gospel truths. Chapter 1 tells us all about Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the body of the church, the image of the image of the invisible God. And this morning, in the short time that we have together, what I want us to see from Paul's words is that Christ is to be central in our lives. And if we've received him, then what does it mean to walk with him in our everyday? Maybe not tomorrow or this week, many children and young people will be making the return to school. And we as a church, as a leadership team, as a congregation, we pray that despite the many temptations, the many pressures that are out there, our students and our children and young people, those believers would remain, that Christ would remain central in their lives as well as our own. And as you look at your Bibles in chapter, in verse 1 that Rachel read to us, we can see Paul says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, so a small city not so far away, and for all who have not seen me face to face. Paul states plainly that he's struggling on behalf of the Colossians. And this word is translated as a word of agony and agonizing. Paul's heart is heavy. He longs for these people. Perhaps many of us sitting here this morning, I know I can relate, of longing for a family member or a friend to know the love of Christ, or those who were once walking with Jesus who are no longer with walking with him. And the Colossians, they were being tempted with many different things, and Paul takes time to express his hope for the church. And as a faithful minister, Preaching the good news, Paul expresses what he desires for them to know, to hold firm. And three things he mentions in this chapter that we read real quick. Paul wants them to be encouraged in heart. This word encouraged is closely related to this idea of being strengthened. Paul longs for the Colossians to be strong and confident in heart. He wants them to be prepared to stand when the standing becomes difficult. Secondly, Paul wants the Colossians to be united in love. That's the second desire that he has for these Christians to be strong-hearted Christian unity. He uses that word knit, of being bound and sewn together. His desire is that the Colossians would be strengthened as they are united as a church, as a body of believers, and one another. And thirdly, Paul wants the Colossians to be confident in their understanding Our human nature is to ask questions, to doubt, to wrestle with what we believe. And if you have a question like I do, if you have doubts at times, if you're thinking, well, what is Christianity all about? Michael, what on earth are you talking about? Come ask, come speak to Frank or another member of the congregation, a trusted believer, and they will help you in your journey of faith, asking and answering and thinking about those questions. Strong in heart, united in love, confident in their understanding of who Jesus is. Three desires for Paul has here for his people and by extension, us today and believers in the world, you and me included. And as we finish this little section, if you've been journeying with us from the 16th of May, we have been looking at heroes of the faith here in Bloomfield, pointing to the true hero, Jesus, from Noah to Gideon to Esther last week. The Bible isn't an individual story of collect of sto- individual stories. It's one big story pointing to us a hero redeemer who transforms ordinary people by his grace. A story where each of us aren't to be front and center, but to live a life that reflects the nature and the character of God. And at times we can get caught up with what this world promises and what it, what it says will bring true joy. We can at times go through the motions of Christianity and of church. At times, as a believer, we can think, well, I became a Christian here. I know the promise of eternal life is here, but what about this gap? How do I walk with Christ in my every day? What will that look like? And Paul is going to tell us in verses 6 and 7, where he says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. 
So we've just set the scene. We know who Paul is writing to. And we'll see what does it mean? What does Paul talk about in those four phrases to walk with Christ? So as you can see, Lydia has joined me without being introduced. It's great to see. Um, Lydia um, has spent this past year um, doing something a little bit different. Um, So we're going to ask Lydia some questions and see what she's been getting up to. So Lydia, can you remind everyone um, or tell everyone, what have you been getting up to this past year? Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, So for the past year, I've been on a gap year and I've been serving here as a youth intern in church. Also, for the majority of the year, I was working in a nursery school as well. It's hard to believe um, that the year's over. It's really flown by. And the order I've been serving in the youth ministry, um, I've been getting involved in lots of the different activities and groups that run here, both online and in person throughout the year. Um, a few examples of things I was doing were um, helping on Friday nights with Merge when we were running it outside, um, leading at our girls' discipleship group, um, doing Bible studies with people and kind of overall just trying to spend time and um, developing relationships with the young people um, in different ways than expected sometimes but I'm really thankful for everything that God was doing throughout it all. It's hard to believe it's been a year so as you reflect back on that year Lydia what are some of your highlights what are some of the things that stand out and um, for you? Yeah there's been so many highlights um, but one in particular was helping with the girls discipleship group and helping lead the younger girls with Petra was just so encouraging and was such a privilege um, to meet every week, open the Bible and discuss with them what it meant for each of our lives. Um, I think the summer has also been a highlight, especially um, as you've seen from the video, being able to run the Holy Bible Club and having such an incredible week with all the kids who came along. Um, But the biggest highlight overall was really getting to know so many of the young people and developing friendships with them and being able to be a part of encouraging them in their walk with Christ. So thank you so much and so you've done lots of different things so lots of meetings lots of times with people but how have you Lydia uh, grown in your faith and your relationship with God this past year? Um, Looking back on it now um, I can see how I've been really impacted in my faith and how I've grown so much in my relationship with God I've been able to build really strong habits of studying the Bible, um, which is something I'd struggled with in the past, but it's been such a good opportunity to get stuck into that this year. Um, And I've really discovered how life-changing that is. I've also grown in trusting God for every day and for the future. He's really taught me to trust in him when doing new things. Two years ago, if you'd have asked me to even stand up at the front of church, I would have said, absolutely no chance of not doing that. So I've seen that when you have complete faith in God, he uses you and leads you in directions that you would never really go yourself or expect. And as I've been trying to decide um, what to do next in the future, it hasn't seemed like the most straightforward process. Um, But again, he's been teaching me to trust him and what he's doing, because when all else seems a bit uncertain, he never is really. Thank you, Lydia. And again, um, as you've been talking about the next steps, um, that is now all being well sorted. Can you tell the congregation here in Liverpool what is next for you? Yes, so my time of being involved in the youth ministry here is not actually really coming to an end, which I'm really, really excited about. In a few weeks' time, I'm beginning a three-year degree in youth work and applied theology. It's a degree issued by Merlins College in England, but I'm going to be studying here with a group of Northern Irish students based at YouthLink in Belfast. As part of the degree, um, I'm going to be on a three-year placement, so I'm very, very thankful that I'm going to be based here in Bloomfield for the next three years, continuing to serve in areas that I did this year and also in new ways as well. And finally, Lydia, how can we as a church um, continue to pray for you? Yeah, um, thank you so much for all the prayers and encouragements this year. It really means so much. Um, But as I move on to this next chapter, if you could pray firstly that I'd be to remain centred on Christ with him as my priority so that everything I'm doing will show him Um, and that I'd have strength and wisdom just in this new course and in the new things I'll be taking on. 
So let us pray for Lydia, and then we will see what is next. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this past year, and for Lydia's um, time here in serving you. Um, But most importantly, Lord, we thank you that her relationship with you has deepened and strengthened through many highs and challenges, and of maybe what is knows what is to do next, that you have walked alongside her. And we do thank you for her family, for for Karen, for Hugh, and for the support system that they are. And we thank you for um, what it means to be part of a church family. So be with Lydia in her next step. As she steps out in faith and walks with you, uh, may you be with her. Help her to cultivate new habits, help her to grow in you, and help her to show the love of Christ with people that she comes in contact with. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, has anyone ever asked you around the house perhaps to do some gardening? Um, I'm not sure if anyone's asked you to do gardening around the house. Well, a few times this summer, Petra has politely asked me if I could help her in the garden. Now, we we don't have really a garden. We don't even have grass. Um, But one aspect that I have discovered, I don't know if I needed to discover it, that I really don't enjoy about gardening is weeding. Um, One of the things that you must remember when weeding is that it's no use just removing what you can see, because in two or three weeks' time, it'll be straight back up again, and then I'll have to go and weed again. But whenever you take each weed, you must remember to take it up by the roots. You have to pull it so it doesn't grow back. Roots are very important. And in our walk with God, we can sometimes be people on the outside, but deep down, be completely different, wrestle with things that are going on. So roots are very important. And we have finished reading from verses 6 and 7 from Colossians, which said, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Paul calls the Colossians back to the foundational teachings that was passed on to them by Epaphras when they first became believers. And at the confession of a believer is that Jesus is Lord. And in the Roman world, that claim that Jesus would, was, is Lord takes or took quite a bit of courage. It would have been, um, it would have had impacts on social levels, political levels, and even fatal consequences. Because the world that Paul is writing from, where these Colossians are, is very much Caesar's world. He was its Lord. We know this because simply, where is Paul writing this letter from? Prison. Why? Because he believed and he proclaimed that Jesus was Lord. Why would he risk everything to do that? Because he recognized who Jesus claimed to be and was. And it's the same in many countries around the world today. To say that Jesus is Lord can still lead to death. If you want to join us in our prayer times on Wednesday evenings, we've been journeying through the top 50 countries of persecution around the world. Yet when people have been transformed by Christ from the inside out, that is all that truly matters. And Paul uses four phrases of what a faithful walk with Christ looks like. What does it mean to walk with Christ today? What does that look like? How does he describe it? Well, Paul's words are rooted in him, built up in him, established in the faith, and abounding in thanksgiving. Rooted and built up. And two areas of Scripture that my mind was taking to this week was Psalm 1, where it says these words, But those who delight in the law of the Lord, and who meditate on his law day and night, that person is like a tree, planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. And secondly, I was taken to Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation in the rock. Paul uses two metaphors 
when walking, he mixes his metaphors. He says, by being rooted in him, but then also being built up in him. And if this is true for us as believers, then the result of that truth directly impacts everything in our lives as we walk with him, as we are followers of him. This will impact our decision making. This will impact how we parent. This will impact our relationship choices. This will impact our priorities as a church. This will impact everything. Paul's prayer in another letter in Ephesians was to grasp how wide, how long, how deep is the love of Christ. How amazing is his love for us. And as we come to an end this evening, it's not this evening, not yet, as we come to an end this morning, one of the main themes from the book of Colossians, this letter, is this idea of being in Christ as we walk, in whom we have redemption, in him all things were created, in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, in whom we are hidden our hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge, walk in him, rooted and built up in him. And to be in Christ means we have accepted his sacrifice of payment for our own sin. The Bible says in our natural sinful state, we are enemies of God. When we walk with Christ and accept his sacrifice on our behalf, he switches our accounts with us. He exchanges our list of sin and his perfect account that is pleasing to God. A divine exchange takes place at the foot of the cross. Our old sin nature is exchanged for his perfect one. Only in Christ is our sin debt canceled, is our relationship with God restored, our eternity secured as we journey and walk with him. That is the power of the gospel. He would go on to say, therefore, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I'm not sure where you're at in your walk with God today. If you haven't begun, if you've started, if you're in the midst of it, if you're in the middle of a storm or a trial, wherever you are at, let's be honest with ourselves and let's be honest with God. And for us this morning, the Bible is the lens in which we are to try to make sense of the world around us. The more we know Christ, the more the war, and the more we are rooted and built up in him, the more we can stand firm in with him. And the final phrase, as you can see here, is a little bit unexpected, abounding in thanksgiving. What has thankfulness got to do with a walk, a Christian walk? Well, pretty much everything. God's grace is not earned. It's a result of something that has been given. It's unmerited. How can we not respond to that with thanksgiving and praise? Paul does that in a prison cell. It's not warm and it's not cozy. His situation, his circumstances didn't dictate his joy found in Christ. Whenever astronauts go into orbit for the first time, they apparently experience the overview effect. Only a select few will ever make it to space. If you have a little bit of money, you may be able to make it next time. But it's impossible to imagine that feeling. Photos just don't do it justice as you see the world from above. And this experience is reserved for a select few. But the gospel truth and the truth of Jesus Christ is for all who have repented of their sin, embraced the love and the grace of our Heavenly Father. So boys and girls, if you're listening and if you've made it this far, as you return to school tomorrow or Tuesday, know that you don't go alone. The world will maybe say you don't measure up. Your identity is found in your things, but you know that your identity is found in Christ as you walk. In Christ, you have a purpose. In Christ, you have an eternal security. Parents, family members, church families, those watching this at home or during the week, in the overflow room or the room behind me, let us walk with Christ, rooted and built up in him. Through the storms in life, he is there. To the highs, he is there. In our doubts, in our fears, he is there. So this week, how can you either continue to know the Lord in your walk? How can you continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord? And ultimately, as believers, how then can you show him to the world today?
Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you that you walk with us. Thank you that you're in the midst of our highs and our lows. And as this week, as we try to make sense of the things that are going on around the world in our family life, we thank you that you go before us. You are there in the midst of everything. So help us to be rooted in you. Help us to be built up in you. And help us to have those Christ-like priorities in our lives as we strive to serve you today and forevermore. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Our prayers of intercessions will be led by a few people, first by Ken, then Ruth, and then Jacob. I am covering a range of topics, but mainly being back to school for our teachers, for our children, and for one particular situation around the world. So Ken is going to lead us, followed by Ruth and then Jacob. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for our service this morning. You are trustworthy and faithful, generous and kind. And you are faithful even when things don't turn out as we would want to or imagine. Thank you for your incredible love. Forgive us when we doubt your goodness and wander far from you. For times we think we know best and don't listen to you. We are sorry, Lord. In our disappointments, feelings, fears and worries, draw us close to you. We pray for those involved in education. We pray for those in positions of leadership and influence who make decisions at a local and government level. We pray especially for Christians who serve and work among you, that you would protect them, that you would lead them with integrity, that they would be influencers for good and work in a way that reflects and honours you. We pray for those who serve on parent-teachers associations and boards of governors who have important decisions to make. May your Holy Spirit guide them. Going forward, we pray that assemblies, SU groups and other Christian support might be allowed to continue, recognising their value as places where children and young people can wrestle with tough questions, explore the Bible and find out who you are. We pray for wisdom for our own church family as we support our local schools. Lord, please stir us to compassion and stir us to action. Please help us to bring encouragement to our children and teachers, both practically and through ongoing prayer. Father, our hearts and our concerns go out to the people of Afghanistan. In a situation as desperate as this, we confess that we do not even know how to pray or what to pray for. We can only imagine the fear that is gripping men, women and children and the uncertainty that lies ahead. We pray that medical help will be provided along with food and shelter for safety from evil and for the ability to settle in without trauma for those who have managed to make it to safety. And Lord, we ask that somehow you would bring light out of such darkness and that people would put their trust in you. We also pray for those known to us who are experiencing any type of medical intervention or treatment at the moment. We ask that they and their families would be aware of God's gracious hand resting upon them through such a time of trial and that they would be given courage and strength to face the situation. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Father God, we thank you for every child and young person in our church family. We pray for those starting school who have been in the past week or this week to come. For those going into a new place, whether the first day of nursery or P1 or moving up to bigger classes, onto secondary school or onto university. Thank you, God, in every step you are with us. We don't need to be afraid. 
Please may our children and young people know this for themselves. And also may they look to you when worry and fear try to creep in. Lord God, help our children to be bold and to stand up for you even when this is difficult. Lord, we pray that they would form good friendships, that you would put other Christians along their path to support them. We pray this especially for those heading to university. May they find strong Christian fellowship in churches near them, and may they stay faithful to your word, even when tempted by the world. Father, we thank you for our Caris families and for the relationships we have with them. Lord, we pray for their children, uh, that you would protect them as they return to their classrooms. Lord, that they would know your peace, especially at this time, and that as a church family, we would continue to support them. Father, we pray that all our schools would be positive places of learning and creativity for our young people. We pray that they would have caring teachers who guide and encourage them through this year. Lord, most of all, we pray that in this year, all of our children and young people would grow closer to you and shine for you in their individual classrooms. Lord, show us your love as we walk and trust in you. Amen. Father God, we pray for our principals, teachers and support staff who work so hard to ensure that we thrive as pupils and reach our potential at school. We thank you for the support and encouragement they give us. We pray that you grant them wisdom for the year ahead in what looks like another challenging term. We pray for those in our church family who work in schools. In challenging moments, please give them patience, energy, and a sense of your presence. May the Christian members of staff continue to be a light for you in our schools. We pray for people starting a new school. May they settle well and be surrounded by good friends. Thank you that we never go alone. Lord, show us your love as we walk and trust in you. Amen. Amen.